this third <clears throat> this third section of language things is all about the power of ambiguity um, in and the potential for using ambiguity in the classroom to generate um, all kinds of new and interesting ideas. Um, so basically here the idea is that um, language again has a bit of a life of its own. Um, you can use a particular word with or with a very specific intention, but because of the the complexity of language and the multiple um, different senses of a word and the way that different words affect each other, um, that that choice of word can lead off in a completely different direction. And normally in the English classroom, we, we tend to sort of treat that as a bad thing. If it's ambiguous, then it's not clear, and if it's not clear, then it's bad, um, and it needs to be fixed. Um, but what I'm suggesting here is that there are plenty of op there are plenty of times where that ambiguity can be exploited and and used to um, lead us down all kinds of interesting and um, almost impossible um, paths of thought that are only really possible through language. Um, and exploiting these puns and this polysemy um, really helps us to um, develop um, the depth of understanding not only of the individual words but of the concepts and of um, the concepts that are those words help to communicate. So I'm looking at three different examples here. The first one will be from Ted Hughes's The Thought Fox. Um, it's an example of antenna classis. Um, the second one um, is from William Shakespeare's Richard III. It's an example of paranomasia. And finally from um, Maurice Sendak's Where the Wild Things Are. Um, I've written their solepsis, but um, it kind of, it doesn't really fit into the definition of solepsis, but I can't really find um, a word to really describe what he's doing with language here. So if, if anyone does find it um, and they want to get in contact with me, that'd be great. I'd love to know. So the first example from The Thought Fox by Ted Hughes. Um, it sets neat prints into the snow between trees, and warily a lame shadow lags by stump and in hollow of a body that is bold to come. The poem is about the persona sitting inside what we assume to be a study um, or a studio at night, waiting for some kind of poetic inspiration. And as they're waiting, they're looking outside the window, and a fox, they see a fox. And they only get a glimpse of the fox, but that glimpse of the fox is enough to, I guess, inspire the poem. Um, and the really important um, aspect that I want to draw your attention to here is the way that Hughes has used the word print um, in the multiple senses um, to really create this sophisticated understanding of the, the creative process. So when the fox sets its prints into the snow, it leaves a track, it leaves a trace, um, it leaves some, some, in a way, a part of its identity. And that's recorded physically in the snow. This is then mirrored um, in the creative process of writing the poem. In the final stanza, he says, Till with a sudden... Sharp, hot stink of fox, it enters the dark hole of the head. The window is starless still, the clock ticks, the page is printed. Here we've got the return of that word print, but this time it's been transformed from the fox's footprints into the ink printed on the page. So we have this relationship between the 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 fox as this creature of the night, um, this sly creature that, that is very hard to catch, and the whole creative process, which sort of happens almost magically in, in a sudden rush. Um, but just like the fox, it still leaves a trace, and that trace is reflected or very much mirrored in the, the imagery that connects the footprints of the fox to the almost like the, the footprints of the pen across the page.
So the second example is from Shakespeare's Richard III. Um, and basically it's Richard, um, considering his situation in life, he's this deformed king, or at this point not the king, but um, he's, he's deformed and he's hated. Um, and so he decides that rather than wallow in despair because of that, he's going he's gonna to own it. Um, and in this great soliloquy, he says, And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover, to determine these fair, well-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasures of these days. The key word here is determined. And Shakespeare plays here on the two senses of the word. You've got determined, meaning having a strong resolve, having decided to do something, and determined... Um, in terms of being predestined or fated, which is a central concept in, in this whole play, um, because it's very much about the relationship between, um, pro or, or the, the tension between providentialism and humanism, between the idea that everything you do is being decided by God, um, versus the idea that we have free will. Um, but in using this single word, um, it kind of implies that we're supposed to take both of these together. So we sort of take this dialectical approach. And when we take the dialectical approach, we get a very different or, or far more complex understanding of what's going on here. We see it as uh, determined being having a strong resolve because of a belief that it is predestined or fated because we see that pretty much Richard's whole um, whole attitude to life is this self-fulfilling prophecy which has been generated by this belief in divine retribution. Um, now, whether or not you want to um, bring in the whole War of the Roses, Tudor myth and all of that, um, it, you, you can, or, or but you don't need to here because really this just this this single this whole play hinges on this single word, um, and you can go and you can focus very much on the text then without having to sort of go down that historical path. Um, from Maurice Sendak's great Where the Wild Things Are, um, he sailed off through night and day and in and out of weeks and almost over a year to where the wild things are. So I'm focusing here on the way that Sendak has used the, the prepositions. Um, so I've pulled them out here. You've got through night and day, in and out of weeks, and over a year. Now, each of these prepositions can be used in a different in a different way, um, or multiple ways. So through can be used as a temporal transition or a physical transition. In and out can both be used physically or as a temporal quantifier. Um, and likewise, over can be used as either a physical transition or a temporal quantifier. Now, because of the way he's sort of structured this, um, we get this impression um, that it all sort of runs on in, in one sort of, well, it does run on in one long compound sentence. And it implies that these prepositions all have to have some kind of consistency. Um, so we can already go, um, we can see the odd one out there is the temporal quantifier. So we have to, we have to get rid of that um, because we know that um, through can't be used as temporal, temporal quantifier. Um, and for the same reason, um, we then have to go, well, the temporal transition doesn't really work. So that means that we're left with the physical transition, which means that all of a sudden we have to rethink the way that we we imagine or we conceptualise the idea of sailing in and out of weeks, because no longer is he um, sailing in and out of um, a, an amount of time. He's suddenly sailing through this physical um, boundary almost as if he's kind of got this time machine or this, this some kind of magical boat that can completely ignore the laws of time um, and move about time through time as if it were uh, li literally like a space. Um, and so just by doing that, Sendak has basically um, managed to 
to create this idea where time is transformed grammatically into a physical barrier that is that his ship that Max's ship passes through and that's part of what makes this this story so magical is that it defies the laws of of um of the physical world in a way because it defies the laws of our of I guess our grammatical world, um, which gives it this whole kind of new depth um, to uh, to our understanding of this of this children's classic.